Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the ionotropic glutamate receptors. Okay, right, so we're currently in the process of discussing the NMDA receptors and their importance in uh, long-term potentiation. Okay, so that's our next topic then, uh, long-term potentiation. So, I'm going to start off with a description of what long-term potentiation is, okay? And then we'll see how NMDA receptors underlie the mechanism behind it. Okay, right. So, what then is long-term potentiation? Well, it's everything to do with this sort of a synapse here, where we have both NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors. So, let me draw this picture out again. So, we have our presynaptic neuron here, which will be releasing glutamate uh, onto the postsynaptic neuron here, which has got these two types of receptor here. Okay, so we've got the NMDA receptor and the AMPA receptor here. Okay, so let's colour them in again. So we've got AMPA in orange and NMDA in turquoise. Now, let's say that we stimulate the presynaptic neuron Okay, and the presynaptic neuron fires an action potential, releases glutamate onto the postsynaptic neuron. What now happens? Glutamate goes over, binds to both the NMDA receptors and, and the AMPA receptors. Okay, and what it will then trigger is it will trigger the opening of the AMPA receptors. Okay, but it will not trigger the opening of the NMDA receptors. Or rather, it will trigger the opening, but they will still have the magnesium arm blocking them because this neuron has a, a resting electrical potential difference across its cell membrane, and therefore the magnesium arm is currently blocking the pore. Okay, so you'll get nothing coming through the NMDA receptor, but through the AMPA receptor, you'll get a depolarizing current, okay, and this will cause an excitatory postsynaptic potential. Now, generally, the excitatory postsynaptic potential that you get will not be big enough to uh, trigger an action potential in the postsynaptic cell, at least not on its own. Okay, so what you'll see instead is a little uh, depolarization of the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. So let's plot this on a graph. Let's plot the electrical potential difference from extracellular to intracellular across the cell membrane. It starts off at negative 65 millivolts. Maybe we get a little blip like that. Okay, and this is our excitatory postsynaptic potential uh, because of the glutamate arriving. Then it'll go back down like so. Okay, um, once the glutamate is gone. Okay, right. Now, the phenomenon of, uh, the phenomenon of long term potentiation is that if we now stimulate this presynaptic neuron like mad, okay, and what do I mean by like mad? I mean at 100 hertz for 3 seconds. Okay, this is the general um, protocol used. Okay, so what does 100 hertz mean? 100 hertz means that you are going to stimulate it 100 times per second. So overall, in these three seconds, you're going to stimulate it 300 times, and it's going to fire 300 action potentials. It's going to release glutamate onto the postsynaptic neuron 300 times, okay? Uh, and that's what I'm going to do, basically. I'm going to stimulate it at 100 hertz for 3 seconds. So I'm going to stimulate it like mad. Okay? If I now wait, leave it for an hour, okay? Go away, have lunch, come back in an hour. And what I'm going to now do is I'm going to stimulate the neuron once again. So I'm going to do the initial experiment again. Okay? I stimulate once. This presynaptic neuron fires an action potential, releases glutamate onto the postsynaptic neuron, and, oh shock, the excitatory postsynaptic potential I now get is bigger, okay? Uh, the ability of the presynaptic action potential to cause an excitatory postsynaptic potential in the postsynaptic cell has got bigger. This is the phenomenon of long-term potentiation, 
okay, that if you stimulate this neuron like mad at some point, then after that, the synapse is strengthened, basically, and the ability of the presynaptic neuron uh, to trigger an excitatory postsynaptic potential in the postsynaptic neuron increases. Okay, that is the phenomenon of long-term potentiation. What I now want to discuss with you is how the NMDA receptors underlie this. Okay, right, so we now need to discuss what happens when we stimulate it uh, at this crazy rate uh, for three seconds. So we are stimulating a hundred times each second. We're releasing glutamate onto the postsynaptic neuron a hundred times in a second. Okay, what does that mean is going to happen? Well, basically, what's going to happen is you're going to be releasing more glutamate onto the postsynaptic neuron before the postsynaptic neuron has actually returned its electrical potential difference across its cell membrane back to resting membrane potential. Okay, so remember what happened when I just stimulated it once in isolation. Okay, so if I just now stimulate this neuron once, what I got is a little excitatory postsynaptic potential that then went down. Basically, when I'm stimulating it at this horrendously fast rate, what's basically happening is I'm um, stimulating it again with glutamate before you've actually got back down to resting membrane potential. So let's say I'm stimulating it again at this point here, okay, and what's going to happen is the excitatory potential uh, postsynaptic potentials are going to add on top of one another, okay, and then it's going to happen again and again and again, and they'll gradually add up to something more considerable, okay, now my picture is a little bit out of scale because my excitatory postsynaptic potentials are too big, okay, um, but you get the message that when you're stimulating at this horrendous rate, what's going to be happening is you're going to be opening the AMPA receptors again before you've actually got rid of all of that excitatory postsynaptic current that was causing the excitatory postsynaptic potential of the previous stimulation. So what's going to start happening is you're going to be building up more and more excitatory postsynaptic current here, which means you're going to be building up a bigger and bigger and bigger excitatory postsynaptic potential. Okay, so the membrane's going to become more and more and more depolarized. Okay, now what's the significance of that? Well, gradually it's going to become so depolarized that that magnesium ion in the NMDA receptor comes out, okay? And then the next time the glutamate comes on, because we're still stimulating it at this ridiculous rate, okay? So you've built up this depolarization. Now the next time you pulse out some glutamate, what's going to happen is the glutamate is actually going to be able to open the pore of those NMDA receptors. Okay, it was always causing the conformational change in the NMDA receptors, but because the magnesium ion was there, you couldn't get uh, any current going through it. Okay, now you get the conformational change, you no longer have the magnesium block, and you get a current coming into the cell. Now, I don't care about the sodium ions, I don't care about the potassium ions moving out. All I care about is the calcium ions coming in. NMDA is fantastic at letting calcium ions in. So you're going to get a very large calcium current coming into this cell. Remember, the concentration of calcium usually in the cytoplasm is 100 nanomolar, tiny, okay? It's going to rise, basically, significantly. Okay, so you have now got a chemical signal that is occurring in the cytoplasm of this axon terminal, and this is what's going to cause the changes that then lead to long-term potentiation. Now, I should say something here about what is not known currently. I am about to present to you with a mechanism by which calcium coming into the cell, uh, the postsynaptic cell, produces long-term potentiation. But I should say something about how um, this mechanism is still controversial. Okay, so basically what happens in long-term potentiation is somehow this calcium signal that's arriving within the postsynaptic cell strengthens that synapse. Now, how could we strengthen a synapse? How can we make an action potential coming down this presynaptic neuron more potent at triggering an action potential coming down the second neuron? 
Okay, well, there are two ways you could do it. You could have presynaptic changes. Okay, so you could have changes within the presynaptic axon terminal here. You could make the presynaptic cell release more neurotransmitter. Okay, if it increased the amount of neurotransmitter it released, then um, that would produce a bigger excitatory postsynaptic potential because you'd be releasing more glutamate, you'd open more glutamate receptors, you'd get in a larger excitatory postsynaptic current and therefore a larger excitatory postsynaptic potential. So that would explain long-term potentiation if that uh, was the mechanism behind it. Okay, And there are people who strongly believe that uh, presynaptic um, changes cause long-term potentiation in glutamatergic synapses like this, but the pathways are not very well understood at all, really. Okay, so it's kind of, um, it's the less popular idea. Okay, the postsynaptic um, theory is more popular than the presynaptic theory. The reason presynaptic is very, very popular, well, the, well, the reason presynaptic has popularity at all, rather, is um, because there are many examples in other species of where glutamatergic synapse long-term potentiation, or at least sensitization, is achieved via presynaptic modulation. Okay, that's why presynaptic has weight. Okay, but the pathways I'm going to show you will all be postsynaptic. Okay, so we're going to make changes to the postsynaptic cell. And what we could do is we could increase the number of uh, glutamate receptors. For instance, we could increase the number of AMPA receptors. If we increase the number of AMPA receptors, then we would increase the amount of excitatory postsynaptic current we get coming into the uh, cytoplasm of the postsynaptic cell for a certain amount of neurotransmitter released. Okay, Or we could make each of these AMPA receptors better in themselves. Okay, uh, I What do I mean by that? Well, Basically, even once you have actually bound glutamate to AMPA receptors, okay, they do not remain open all the time. Okay, so it's not 100% sure that they will actually go into the open confirmation when you bind glutamate to them. It's not as binary as that. Instead, there is something called an open probability, okay, which is the probability that when you look at an AMPA receptor, and you will find it in the open confirmation. Okay, and this is denoted PO. So just to say this simply, okay, if we've got an AMPA receptor here that has got four glutamate molecules bound to it, it will spend a certain fraction of its time in the open state, and it will take sorry, it will spend a certain amount of time in the closed state, okay, or in a state that um, has a closed pore. Okay, uh, so Basically, the open probability is the probability that you will find it in the open state. So it's the fraction of its time that it spends in the open state, because that's the probability that you will find it in the open state. So let's say it spends 30% of its time in the open state when it's got glutamate bound to it, and 70% in a closed state. Okay. Therefore, the open probability will be 3 tenths. Okay, so the binding of glutamate increases the open probability hugely. I mean, without the glutamate bound, the out open probability will be tiny, okay? Uh, but it doesn't make it 100% is the key thing to understand. What we could do is we could change the AMPA receptors so that their open probability with glutamate bound to them was enhanced, okay? So we could move it up to something like 50%, um, and therefore they'd spend more time in the open state and that in more current into the cell, and then you'd get a greater excitatory postsynaptic current, okay, and therefore a greater excitatory postsynaptic potential. This is what we are going to look at. We are going to look at a mechanism by which calcium coming into uh, the cytoplasm of the postsynaptic neuron is going to trigger the uh, increased open probability of these AMPA receptors, which will then trigger an increase in the excitatory postsynaptic current. Uh, okay, right. 
However, you also do get an increase in the expression of AMPA receptors on the uh, surface of the postsynaptic membrane. Okay, but that takes longer to occur than this regulation of individual AMPA receptors. Okay, so we'll discuss the mechanism underlying this in the next video.